Well, six weeks ago, True News hosted an unprecedented meeting of some of the key watchmen in America. These men had never gathered together in a room in the past, over the years of their ministry, and it was uh, it was an anointed time. I I felt led by the Lord to invite those men to be the guests of True News. We hosted it. We put them up in hotels. We fed them. We wanted to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying to them, and we gave them complete privacy and confidentiality. We did not record any of the sessions. We wanted everybody to speak freely from their heart and mind what the Holy Spirit was saying to them. One of the men who attended was my good friend, Pastor David Lankford, host of the Voice of Evangelism radio program and senior pastor of the Family Worship Center in Stanley, North Carolina. He's on the phone with me right now. Pastor David, good to hear from you again. Good to hear from you, Brother Rick. We're excited about the great things that God is doing right now. Yes, sir. Uh, Pastor, um, you participated. Your wife, Kim, uh, blessed us. She attended uh, the meeting with us. You you were here. It's hard to believe that uh, almost six weeks have gone by since since you and Kim and the other watchmen left, but time is uh, is moving very quickly. What, what were your impressions of those four days of meetings? Well, first of all, uh, they were tremendously edifying. Uh, the Bible says how good, how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And I received strength as well as encouragement uh, from the brotherhood uh, in Christ Jesus. Um, I suppose the the consensus, Rick, that I sense that we all are aware something is going to transpire this year as to the gravity, the depth, and the breadth of it. I don't know that any of us know or fully understand that. But as I was sharing with you earlier today, I have such a great peace and solace in my heart, in my spirit, uh, that God is totally in control of everything. And the scripture that keeps pervading my mind is Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And I've got just a confidence and a certitude uh, that God is working everything out together right now for all of us. We're in different places uh, locality-wise, we're in different places spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, but God is so concerned about all of us. Uh, he's going to work everything out together uh, for His good because we are called according to His purpose. And so I'm encouraged with the, the new level and place that He's going to, to take me, take you, take the other men, because I think we're getting to the time, uh, as Leonard Ravenhill said many, many years ago, uh, God has a lot of sleeping giants that he's been grooming, he's been maturing, he's been nurturing. And when the fullness of time comes, he's going to release these men into the fields to, to reap the harvest that he said he was going to have in the book of Revelation. David, I don't want to be presumptuous and, and attempt to speak personally for each of the men who attended that that event, but I, I think it's it's safe to say that the general consensus among all the watchmen who attended, was, number one, they believe that the time of warning the United States of America to repent of its sins has come to an end. There is some type of very severe chastisement coming this year. And then number two, I, I think many of the watchmen sense that their ministry is in transition and that the role of being a watchman to America and warning of, of great judgment and trouble, that that ministry is is coming to a close this year, and those those watchmen are going to be released by God into a new type of ministry. Is that is that a fair assumption? Absolutely. Um, you know, in January, uh, I went on an extended fast, and I felt like God said this year was a year of transition. And it's evident to me, and I, I can't share my entire heart today, but I have gotten multiple witnesses that my ministry is, is just on the precipice of change. Uh, I'm not really sure what the change is, because as I share so often, when God gave Joseph his dream, 
His dream just showed the sheaves falling down and paying obeisance to him. The dream didn't show him the pit, the prison, Potiphar's wife, etc. Because if God were to show us everything, we would be overwhelmed by it and say, God, I, I just can't do this. Uh, whether it be great things or small things, we would, we would be overwhelmed with the significance of them. So I believe God obscures the perfection of his will, if I could use that term, so that we don't become overwhelmed. Um, I know the Lord has spoken to my heart oftentimes through the years, are you really ready for what I want to do? You know, Peter said, I'm ready. I'm ready both to die and to go to prison. But he wasn't ready. He thought he was, but he wasn't fully ready. But after Pentecost, there was no doubt. He was fully equipped. He was fully ready. And Fifty days prior to that, he's cursing and swearing, I don't know the man Jesus. But on the day of Pentecost at Acts 2, 36, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know us surely. That same Jesus whom you have crucified, God, hath made him both Lord and Christ. He was talking to the Jews. He wasn't intimidated by them no longer. He had no fear of them. He was willing to stand and say that Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and King of kings. So the transition is coming. I believe we're in the throes of it, Brother Rick. We're, we're, we're in it. It's not that it's going to come. We're in the process right now. Uh, it's kind of like the biscuits in the oven. It's not quite ready, but when it gets that uh, length of time of baking, you know, it's going to come out. We're in the baking process, and God's getting ready to pull us out of that fiery furnace uh, of affliction and move us to another place, another purpose, per se. And uh, I, that, that, that's what I sense more than anything else. We're all getting ready to move into another path. Uh, it may be a, a greater path, greater open doors, uh, another direction. I don't know, but I think he's preparing the people to, 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 to do what he wants them to do in, in whatever that might be, whatever capacity. Yes, I know for me, Pastor David, I... I, I what I'm sensing for us is that the transition is going from warning to, uh, you know, warning people to repent and prepare for this judgment. And and where what he's showing me for the future is we will be devoting our time to to uh, nurturing and strengthening the Christians who heard the warnings, who repented of their sins, who grieved over the sins of the nation, but. They will be, um, you know, when you when judgment falls, it falls like rain. It falls on the just and the unjust. And so the, the Christians that, that were aware that this judgment was coming, they're going to need great comfort and encouragement. And I, I believe personally that's where the Lord is taking our ministry. It will not be so much warning because the, the, there will be no point in warning. The ju- when the judgment falls, there's... There's no, you know, it's like when your dad is paddling you. There's, there's no sense in telling your brother, "Hey, if you if you don't behave, dad's going to come here and, and paddle our butts." You know, when the paddling's in process, in progress, it's, you know, only an idiot doesn't see it. So, well, the change is coming, and we're, as you said, we're already many of these men are already in the process. They they sense the Holy Spirit telling them to to prepare for a transition. Uh, little by little, the the Lord is releasing instructions to you know do this do that decouple here make plans here you know and he's getting them ready but as you say we don't have the big picture we don't know exactly what it's going to look like we just know he's decoupling us from our past ministry and moving us in the direction of a new ministry but something for i mean one thing is for certain i it, for me i am certain this is the year it happens well, absolutely. Uh, the scripture again, Jeremiah thirty-two twenty-seven. Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That scripture has just been pervading my mind day after day after day. Why? Because when God gets ready to release us and go into a place, the natural man is going to question: Is this right? Will you take care of me? Will you provide for me? Will you will you help me? And He's challenging us through His Word. I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything? Too hard for me. It's just like Moses. God wanted him ultimately in Pharaoh's courts. And God led his mother, Jehokabed, to prepare a little ark and put him in there. Then took Miriam, his sister, took him down there to the bulrushes, and she watched Pharaoh's daughter take him 
she walks up in a very casual manner and says, oh, you have a child here. Yeah, and then Pharaoh's uh, daughter says, uh, I need a Hebrew lady to nurse him and will pay him. So what does Miriam do? She goes and gets his mother, and the mother is paid to nurse the baby. And, and, and so God is so concerned uh, in our lives, he'll make a fool out of the devil in blessing us. I, I remember when the Lord began to open my mind to Jehokabed and, and Moses. She's rejoicing because God is saving her one son, her Hebrew boy, when Pharaoh was wanting to kill them. And she's rejoicing because God has saved her son. And the Lord said she was rejoicing over that one son. He said, but I was rejoicing. I'm going to use that son to save a nation. Not just one person, but I'm going to save an entire nation of people. So we, we get just a little piece here and there, and we think, well, God's doing this right now for this purpose. But his plan is so far-reaching. It, it covers such a, a greater landscape, a greater windfall than what we could ever imagine. I mean, she was happy. You know, God is saving my baby, my baby. But no, God was saving him to save a nation. And, and that's why we're so insignificant in the grand scheme of things, because God's plan is so vast and so large, brother. And we're going to be used in his plan and in his purpose. That's right. You know, uh, Pastor, before the, the Watchman's meeting, I sent to all the invited men a copy of a vision that had been received by a woman in Bombay, India. Her name is Swana Ja. She's, a, she's an attorney in Bombay, India. She had this vision in November 2007, and I contacted her and invited her on the program, and I, we were the first uh, radio program to introduce her to, to the general public. And, and I will say this, uh, I recently communicated with her and, and asked her to come back on the program, and she politely declined. She said the Lord has told her to be quiet. To sh she shut down her website. She took everything off the Internet. She said, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why. But the Lord just recently told me, shut down the website, no more visions, no, no more prophecies to America. So, um, but she had, what, here's what happened, David. She, she told me that, she, she, that Benny Hinn was in uh, Bombay, India, and she attended an event that he had for the pastors, the Christian pastors of India. And she was so horrified by what he was teaching them as doctrine inside that meeting, she was just just could not believe the 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 heresies that he was teaching. Well, after that meeting, she began to have a series of visions about America, and she didn't understand why God was speaking to her about the church in the USA because she she said she had not been in America for over twenty years. But these visions began to flow to her about America. Well, the one that I sent to you and. Steve Quayle and all the other men who came to the event was her vision um, um, that um, land that plane. Right. Okay. And in that in that vision, she said the watchmen were flying in a plane, and they were looking out the windows, and they were looking down at the ground, and they they saw the sewer pipes that had burst open in the filth and the tr trash that was coming out of the sewer pipes and polluting the nation. And the, the watchmen were horrified as they looked out the window. But the passengers on the plane, which represented the men and women who followed their ministries, um, basically you know, were, were arguing, they were obsessed with who was at fault for this filth and trash that was coming out of the, out of the sewer pipes that had broken open. And so the watchmen were getting, they were spending too much time talking about the, the, the sewer pipes and who was responsible for the breaking of the sewer pipes and who was responsible for the sewage that was in the pipes. And that, and that as the plane was flying, the uh, ground control uh, operator was shouting into the headphones of the pilot, land that plane, land that plane. Now, the people can go online. They can find this uh, vision on other websites. She has taken her website down. But when the, when the watchman landed the plane, 
She said in this vision that they stepped off the plane in a new land, and it, and in the beginning, they were they were confused because there was no need to preach judgment anymore, and 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 for a while the watchmen didn't know what to do. But then she goes on to say that the the Holy Spirit began to supernaturally impart business skills in these watchmen, and they began they became tent makers. And they began to fund ministry through their tent-making businesses. So I, when, when I called this meeting, Pastor David, I, that, was the, that vision was burning in my mind. And I, I felt like, I, and I wrote to Swana Swa and I told her, I said, this vision is coming to pass. The watchmen are coming to Vero Beach. I believe the Lord is now saying, land that plane. Land that plane. Stop talking about the filth and the garbage that is being spewed into America. Don't analyze it anymore. Don't try to figure out who's to blame, who did it, you know. Just land the plane and start with the new phase of ministry. Amen. That, 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 that's what, as I said, we're in the transition, like the plane is flying. We're, we're on the, the fuselage. We're in the cabin. We're, 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 we're on the, 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 the flight. And wherever we land, we'll begin that new ministry. And however God does it. See, that's, that's the thing about it, because I, I, I'm so concerned that a lot of times people, just like the men, didn't know what to do. See, they, 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 they preached this particular message for so long. Now how do you turn and minister? How do you pour the oil and the wine? Because the judgment has been executed. The, 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 now we're in a new phase, like you said about the paddling. Uh, you know, it's, it's over with. Uh, now what do we do? Uh, and this is why I believe we're getting prepared and we're all about to get uh, a new direction, a new order, a, a new mission, per se, that we're going to launch out into that. And as I said, and, and I've got just the greatest amount of peace in my heart. I mean, you know, here's what people need to understand. You can have a hailstorm on the outside, but you can have absolutely peace on the inside. Like the disciples were so afraid they were going to lose their lives, Christ was on the hinder part of the ship asleep. He was the personification of peace. He was asleep. He wasn't worried by the storm, by the tempest or whatever. And he stepped to the bow of the ship and says, Peace, be still. And a, there was a great storm. And then in the end there in chapter 8 of Matthew, it says, And there was a great peace. So the great peace cancels out the great storm. And, and, and so they marveled. They marveled. We're going to be amazed at what God is getting ready to do and how he's going to do it. I was in prayer this morning, and I was so humbled by just the mere presence of God and how that God has always cared for me. He's always loved me. He's always nurtured me. In Psalms 115, verse 12 and 13, David said, The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will help us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. So whether you're small or you're great, he's mindful of you, and he will bless you. And uh, that, that, that's just the comfort and the solace that I'm receiving right now in my spirit from the Lord. I, I just don't have any anxiety, brother. That's right. I don't either. David, this is several years ago, during a fast, the Lord spoke to me, and, and, and I wasn't seeking these things. You know, when, when you're on a fast, you don't know what he's going to say to you. Exactly. You can go into a fast for one reason, and he's got ten other reasons. You know, he, he wants to talk to you because of the fast. What it does, it we we shut up long enough for him to speak. So he Amen. takes advantage of that quiet time, and he, he he downloads a lot of stuff to us. But he told me this is um it was 2010. He he told me that um, um, America's uh, uh, wealth, prestige, and power and influence in the world was going to start disappearing quickly. Well, that has already happened. And uh, he said that there was a storm coming that the USA would take the brunt of the storm. They would be felt worldwide, but the USA would take the brunt of the storm. And he said the manner in which world evangelism, well, not just evangelism, he said the manner in which ministry and world evangelism and missionary work has been financed is going to change radically because the financial uh, conditions in America will no longer permit the uh, raising of millions of dollars to be sent worldwide to 
missionary groups and evangelistic groups around the world. And he told me, he said, Rick, I'm going to change your costume. And I said, Lord, what do you mean by that? He said, I'm going to put you back into a business suit. And he said, because it's going to become very difficult and very dangerous to travel in the world as a minister of the gospel. Wow. And he said, I'm going to send you into nations as a businessman, but you are a priest unto me. And you are to operate in stealth. And you are to, you are to build the church underground, but you will go as a businessman. David, I believe we're at this point. I really do. I believe the, the economic storm is so great. They, I, don't, I don't know if the money manipulators can keep this thing on artificial life support beyond the summer or fall. I mean, they, they are pulling rabbits out of their hats. I mean, i got to give it credit to, to, to the New World Order boys. They can, they can find a rabbit in a hat where you and I wouldn't see anything. So it's been times in the past that it looks like they're finished. They can't they can't hold it together, and they somehow they pull out another rabbit, and they keep they keep the the illusion going. But that's all the world economic system is right now. It is an illusion. It's smoke and mirrors. Well, what what is about to happen? And I think many times we get caught up with the superficial things. We're 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 getting ready for the debut of the Antichrist. All this is coming to a zenith. And the world is going to demand this leader, this, this man to resolve our, our problems. I remember in the 80s, and, 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 and I was still a pre-tribber, and I had a dream one night, and our nation was in chaos. We, was, we were tremendously troubled and vexed. I remember the camera was on the president, and he's conveying his sentiments, how things are bad, et cetera, et cetera. He said, but I want to introduce to you a man that's going to resolve all of our problems. And when the camera went to pan to this man, my dream ended. I knew it was the Antichrist, but it, I never, I never get to see who he was. But there's going to be a consolidation of power, and that's right in line with Revelation chapter 17. The kings of the earth are going to give their power to this man. They're going to submit to him, uh, whether it's uh, you know, sovereignly or, or working together, co-working, etc. But they're going to surrender this. And so we're, we're, we're getting in this program, this mode of the debut of the Antichrist to come on the scene. He comes on as a man of peace. What duplicity and what deception he's going to come on. And then underneath, he's a murderer, he's a liar, he's a warmonger. And, and, and of course, we know the gravity of what will take place once he gets in power. But the world is getting ready for this. I think it's ironic. Israel is threatening to go ahead and hit Iran, and Benjamin Netanyahu used a very disturbing term to me. He was asked about Obama uh, if he goes to war. He said, I'm not concerned about him. He will be paralyzed with the United States elections. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a very disturbing term, paralyzed. Why? Because I can foresee a constitutional crisis, him declaring martial law, shutting down the government, whether it's a hanging chad, his name is not on several state ballots, etc., for a presidential election. And while he is in power, you know, once, a, once the election comes and goes, he's still in power till January the 20th. I can see a, a constitutional crisis. And that will be the most dangerous time between Election Day, November 2012, and January 20th, 2013. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even though there will be a, uh, have, have been a new election, this man is still in power, and, and, and we will be vulnerable. I, I think it's ironic. I know the Mossad knows what's going on. There's no doubt in my mind. But for him to use that verbiage, he will be paralyzed with the U.S. elections. Everything coming out of Israel or any sources that are inside the, the Netanyahu government indicate that Mr. Netanyahu is furious with Barack Obama. They are not on good terms. He doesn't trust Obama. And that the decision has been made that Israel will attack Iran in 2012 before the November election because Israel will need the pressure of the elections in America to, to uh, force the hand of Barack Obama to order the U.S. military to engage in the war on behalf of Israel. Exactly. 
Exactly. So if that is the case, then I would say that late September to mid to late October will be the the target date for that war. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Even in history, uh, you go back and look at the Psalmist David, uh, the book of 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, things like that. War was either in the spring or in the fall. And, uh, of course, since 1998, the Lord has shown me these events take place in the fall of the year. 9-11 was in the fall. The, 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 the uh, financial debacle in 2008 was in the fall. There's a pattern here. And as, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been will also be again. And, and so we're watching these things. And it's, I've always witnessed it. it. It gets more intense as we get toward the fall of the year. And there's an event, maybe not as dramatic as another event, but we kind of uh, get off the simmering uh, plateau. And then we go back into the beginning of the year. And things kind of abate, and then through the year we, 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 we just keep ratcheting up the crisis. We, things get worse, and then there's a, there's a release or, or something of that nature. But that does not mean that in the meantime, just like in, in 2005, we had Katrina. We had 2001, the 9-11 uh, scenario. Then we in 2008, we had the financial scenario. But in the middle of that, we had a devastating hurricane that, that struck this nation, and God evicted 500,000 people from New Orleans. So... Uh, th- this is a process, all of it, and uh, I just want to encourage people uh, to seek God for peace. Uh, Isaiah 26, 3, whose mind is stayed upon thee, he will keep him in perfect or complete mature peace. And God wants us to have peace. He doesn't want us troubled and, and vexed and, 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 and full of uh, trepidation and anxiety. He wants us to have peace. And, uh, and I, I, I personally... Uh, sense the peace because I know that God Rick is working all of this out he's just he's just taking care of business and if we'll be led by the Holy Ghost and follow him we don't have anything to fear brother that's right but I would underscore we have to follow the instructions he gives each of us because he speaks he speaks individually that's right to his sons and daughters and if we do not obey him in the instructions that he gives us, we can suffer negative consequences. Absolutely. It doesn't mean we've lost our salvation no, or anything no. like that. It just says in the natural realm, we will suffer negative consequences because we did not heed the voice of the Lord when he told us specific things to do. Just like when Paul told the group in Acts 27, he said, Brethren, I perceive there will be great damage in this voyage. But they didn't listen to him. They didn't take... See, the Holy Ghost was warning Paul, but they went and they sailed anyway. And, of course, we know the story of the storm Eurachlidon. But God had already forewarned. And so obedience is so much better than sacrifice. And so to obey uh, is the key to our success. Um, You know, I was reading in in, in Joshua 1. We all are familiar with the passage over there in Joshua 1, 8, where he says, Do not let the book of the law depart out of your mouth. He said, But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. We have the ability to make our way prosperous and have good success. He said, For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Why? Because you have meditated on my word, you have listened to my word, you have responded, you've observed my word, you've You've obeyed it. And then people don't realize we have the ability to make our way prosperous or to make our way full of sorrow. It's a choice, brother. That's right. Pastor, uh, before before we started the program, you and I were chatting um, off the air, and I was telling you that that, uh, there are two general dates that keep reappearing for me this year. And and when I say uh, reappearing, I'm talking about either... Uh, in dreams and visions that members of my family have experienced or dreams and visions that listeners have have experienced and they have emailed me or sent a letter or called us and told us about it. It may be because of things that I read in in world news stories. It's a combination of things. It's not just one source. But those uh, those two general dates are July 2012 
and November 2012. Personally, I tend to believe that the real, really bad trouble is going to be November. And I can tell you many of the many reasons why I believe that, but there is something about July, and I don't, I'm not, I don't necessarily believe something's going to happen in July. I feel like the Lord is telling many people that, that their time to, to complete assignments he has given them, specific instructions, it must be done by July and August. Uh, do you, are you sensing any of this in your own life? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we got a confirmation from the Holy Ghost over the weekend. I, I can't say exactly right now, but I, I know there's coming a change in my ministry in July. There's no doubt about it. There's a specific change that's coming. I know what it is, and, and, and I'm preparing for it and, and making the correct preparations for that in its entirety. Uh, and I'll share that at the, the appropriate time. But I know that's my time is in July. And, uh, so you didn't know that when you were here six weeks ago? No, sir. You told me the Lord was dealing with you about changes coming in your ministry, but you certainly know. You said, I'll know by the end of the year. Right. But now, six weeks later, you're telling me the Lord has spoken to you since that meeting, and, and he's told you it's July. Right. And, and here's the key. Lord, the Lord spoke something to my life, but we got confirmation from another source. Oh, that's See, when you know it's God. That, that's when you know it's God. There, there's, there's no question. Uh, my wife, uh, I told Steve the other night, I said she was literally giddy. Uh, Sunday afternoon, we, we got the confirmation. We, we, we got the communication. We got it direct from the Holy Ghost. And we knew this, this was it. And so we don't, that's what I'm talking about, the, the peace, because God's taking care of it. And if we obey him, and the people have got to understand, you've got to obey God. You you cannot do it your way. You have to obey the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's the key to success. And here again, you've heard me talk about this. The, the two uh, Greek words for time is chronos and karios. Chronos is the succession of time, one, two, three, four, five. But the karios is a divine appointed time when four ordained events have to come to pass. And so there are events that's already foreordained in your life. They have to come to pass at this particular time. You can't, you can't go past that time, and you can't proceed before the time. And so that's where we're in. We're in the, the karyos, the divine appointed time when foreordained, predestined events have to come to pass. And that's where we got such the profound witness, and that the, 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 the witness was a confirmation. This is the time. This, this there's no doubt about it. This is the time. And so you, you've got to move with that. Simeon. Simeon's name literally means hearing. And God had told Simeon, he promised him before he died, he would see the salvation of Israel. And brother, before he died, the Holy Ghost. There are three references to Simeon in Acts chapter 2. Verse 25 says, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse 26 and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. There were three Holy Ghost witnesses that you need to run to the temple now. Why? It was the eighth day. Jesus had to be circumcised on the eighth day. He ran in there. Guess who's there? Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And he takes him and lifts him up before God, and you know, he says, you know, he's a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And then Anna, the prophetess, was also in the temple, and she happened to go in there at that same time. And it says, and she coming in that instant, and that word instant, again in the Greek, is a particular time, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all of them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. There were those who were anticipating this time. And when it came, they got multiple witnesses, just like Sam. He got three witnesses from the Holy Spirit. You need to get to the temple now, because this time would come and go, and he would miss it. See, if it was the ninth day, he's a day late. If it's the seventh day, he's a day early. Christ had to be circumcised on the eighth day. So he, he said, go now to the temple. And uh, Mary and Joseph were not perplexed. He took the child out of her arms and lifted him up and began to prophesy. 
I'm going to, in the remaining uh, 14 minutes, I'm going to take this conversation to another level. Last Sunday, I I, I had a, a revelation of something that I believe is uh, is of of God. Uh, about a month ago on the program, I I mentioned the the abortion uh, rates in various nations. Uh, the percentage of pregnancies terminated in abortion. In the United States, it's 24 point some percent. Almost one-fourth of all pregnancies in America are aborted. Uh, it's actually higher in other lands. I looked at the Western Hemisphere, and I, I, I remember specifically Panama was like 0.02% of abortions. Wow. Well, now, this is the this is the light that came on in my head the other day, and I want to thank John Price uh, because his comments that he made really spurred me to start thinking this way, and the Lord began to put this together for me. I was looking at, I was looking at two things, Pastor David, in the Western Hemisphere. You know, Canada, U.S., Central America, South America, the Caribbean, and that is the percentage of abortions in each country, and the percentage of immigrants coming into the country who are Islamic. This is what I found. The higher the abortion rate, the higher the Islamic immigration rate. Wow. And I believe what the Lord said to me is, the Muslims are going to be his avengers on the abortionists. Oh, I believe that. And that, be, that as, they, as they kill the babies... God is sending bloodthirsty Muslims into those nations as his avengers, and they will extract revenge for the killing of children. Because the Bible says that without repentance, every innocent life that's taken, it requires the sacrifice of a life if there's no repentance. Right. Well, Pastor David, the USA has, has murdered 70 million babies and if that biblical principle holds true, then the Muslims are going to kill 70 million Americans. At the, right. Now, that's going to shake up some people's theology. And, and, and let me tell you, when the, when the Muslims are done extracting the revenge, God will deal with the Muslims. Because oh, they, that's the way he does it. That's right. So, so don't think that they're the good guys. No. If, if you are an evil army used to, to punish... Uh, a backslidden nation, uh, you're in trouble because as soon as the punishment's done, you get you get taken care of. He raised up Babylon to take over Jerusalem, and then when the 70 years had come full circle, he raised up the Medo-Persians to take over Babylon and punish them for their uh, harshness toward Israel. So, And, of course, in Jeremiah uh, 51, 11, make bright the arrows, Gather the shields, the Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. So just as he raised up the spirit of, of King Darius to take over Babylon when Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, was king, he raises up the spirit of Islam again the second time, the Medo-Persian empires to attack us. It, again, there's nothing new under the sun, Brother Rick. That's right. It's just a repeat. Well, several weeks ago, a, a, a young man who's a, a businessman, a listener on the west coast of the USA, had a very, very disturbing dream in which he said it was like a hand writing on a whiteboard in the dream, and he saw the words in red. They appeared one word at a time, and it said, now is the time for all Christian men and women to flee the cities. Mm -hmm. That is synonymous with the handwriting on the wall. That's right, because the nation has been found wanting and it's been judged. And so what I'm saying is I, I believe the time is running out for our audience. If you are living in a major urban center, if you are in New York City, if you're in Miami, Philadelphia, Dallas, San Francisco, any major urban center, I believe the time is running out for you to get out of that 
major city. The major cities are going to flow with blood. Why? Because they're flowing with blood right now. Under the cities, in the sewage pipes, the blood of the aborted babies is flowing under your city right now. And what's going to happen is revenge is going to be brought on those cities and the blood will flow on the streets, not under the streets. It will flow on top of the streets. Right. And you need, to, you need to flee those cities now while you can. There used to be a time, David, when people would ask me, should I leave the city? I would say, if, if God didn't tell you to go, I, I, I wouldn't go. But things have changed. I would say now, if God hasn't told you to stay, then you need to get out. Yeah. I, 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 it's, it's, it's a day of peril. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, and, and I'm just like your heart, my heart, we grieve for the lost. Anyone that has the true spirit of Christ grieves for what we know is coming. It's, God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. He has no joy in that. And people don't understand that. But God is so just. His, his holiness demands righteous judgment. He's, he, he has to judge rightly. He, he cannot. The, the Lord gave me a verse the other day, Job 32, 9. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Just because a man is a great man or supposedly has great wisdom, if he's not a spirit-filled believer, he doesn't understand why. An old man with, who should be wise in his years would say, well, why would God do that? It's because he doesn't understand God. That's he right. Doesn't, he doesn't understand the spirit of God. Moses and, knew his ways. Yes. Yes. If you don't know the ways of God, you're you're just going to be tossed to and fro. You may know God as your Savior, but if you don't know His ways, you don't know how to flow in the in the Holy Spirit. You don't know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Well, Romans eight fourteen: For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're called the sons of God. God wants to lead us. He's the shepherd; we're the sheep. He wants to lead us, but you can't get that into some people's minds. You know, they they. They, um, I want to read a passage in, in uh, Psalm 78, beginning at verse 35. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. They lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, and did not stir up all his wrath. He is so compassionate, wanting people to make it right. But the bottom line is, if they don't make it right, he has to judge. He, he doesn't want to. He says in the book of Second Chronicles 36, I rose up early. I sent you prophets. You abused my prophets. You abused my messengers. And I thought, that's, we've been abused, brother. We, we, we've suffered a lot of heartache and hardship because of our stand. But that's because of obedience to God. And he said, you've abused my prophets. You've abused my messengers. Now the time has come that my mercy is over with, judgment. And uh, I, I don't say this uh, uh, joyful, but I do look forward, brother, to the next level of ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been pouring out my heart since 1994 after God showed me the fallacy of the pre-tribulation rapture for, 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 for nearly 18 years now. I've been preaching this coming judgment, it, 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 and, and we're there. We're, we're there. God is not slack and not leaving a witness to the world. Judgment's coming. He, Noah was a witness to the world. Men are witnesses to the world of Jesus Christ and his judgment. The two spies were witness to Rahab the harlot. She said, I've heard of your God. He's a terrible God. And they said, that's right. We're taking down Jericho. But she was spared through that little red cord. And so the witness remains evident, and it's what you do with the witness is up to you. You know, you can say, well, I don't believe that witness. Well, that's fine. But the witness, God leaves himself a witness so that we can know what's the truth. And you know, Pastor David... With, with with the dire things that are on the horizon, the global financial collapse, the war in the Middle East, the possibility that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant could collapse and 
hundreds of tons of radioactive material go into the atmosphere. I mean, these are apocalyptic things. Sure. This is apocalyptic. I don't know what else could happen aside from just total world war. But we're that's li- going to happen. We know there's going to be a third world. That's war. right. We are living in perilous times, and but at the same time. God has a group of people on this planet who are going to finally get it right, and they are going to become the book of Acts chapter, I mean, the book of Acts 2. Amen. The second, the second, you know, rendition of the book of Acts. They're going to, they're going to see it. They're going to understand. This is it. Absolutely. This is it. We either, we either represent God with full confidence and, and, and bravery, or nobody else is going to do it. And there is a church that's going to go forth in this darkness, and the light of God is going to arise on them and through them, just as it says in Isaiah. Amen. The greater the darkness, the greater the light. In other words, this, this gray area is about to be over with. You get in, get out, or get run over there's no in in between stuff anymore. God's tired of that in between stuff, brother. He's tired of it. You know, either you love him or you don't. He said, "No man can serve two masters," and that's what the church is trying to do. The church is in the middle of the road, trying to appeal to the world, but trying to maintain a relationship with Jesus. You cannot do that. God is a holy God. He's a sanctified God, and we are to be holy. We're called to be saints. Think about that. We are called to be saints. I'm not talking about from the Catholic Church. I'm talking about through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're called to be saints of God. And there is a difference in just a proverbial uh, Christian and a saint of God, brother. At at the beginning of of the month of May, I was fasting, and and I heard one, one thing that I heard was the fate of many people will be sealed in the next 90 days. And the Holy Spirit said, they will make good decisions or bad decisions, right decisions or wrong decisions. That's right. With their fate will be sealed in the next 90 days. I can't shake this feeling, Pastor David, that angels are marking people right now. Amen. They're being marked. They're being sealed either for destruction or for salvation and deliverance. That's right. That's, that's Ezekiel chapter 9. The, the, the angel took the ink horn and started marking everybody that was God's. And the destroying angels were told, when you see the mark, don't touch them. And the ones who were marked for God, what were they doing? Why did they get marked? Because they were listening to the word of the Lord and they were obeying God. And they were grieving oh, over yeah. the sins Absolutely. of the nation. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, and that's, 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 that's why the key, and you know the sad thing is, he began at the temple, or he began at the house of God. And he said, Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. I preached a message years ago as an evangelist. Being marked now, and you're either going to bear the mark of God or the mark of the Antichrist, that every man might receive a mark in his right hand or on his forehead. God's God's going to put either his mark on you or the devil's going to put his mark on you. One of the two, brother. But people need to be very careful about what they're doing, where they're going, what they're thinking, what they're saying right now in, in the last days of May and in June, in July and, and, and August of 2012. Horrific events are up ahead and you are being marked. You're being sealed. That's right. Right now. And when those things come... You won't have time to unseal yourself and get the right seal. You better have the right seal on you when those events happen. Brother, they need to start pouring out of these churches by the hordes. I mean, pouring out, quit tithing, quit supporting these ministries, and support the true servants of God. Quit wasting your money on these charlatans and pretenders. I know it feels good. This is not the message you want to hear, but you better obey God. Brother, this is, this is an eternal thing. This is not just a, a parenthetical time frame. This is eternity, and people are playing with it. That's you right. Don't, you, this, you don't get a second chance. If Hillary Clinton wanted a do-over, you're not going to get a do-over. That's right. If you're giving money to these uh, charlatans on TV, you are an enabler of their false ministries, and you'll pay 
a, con- a consequence for it. Well, there's our closing music. My guest today, Pastor David Langford, host of the Voice of Evangelism radio program, senior pastor of the Family Worship Center in Stanley, North Carolina. You know, many of us love to quote Psalm 91 about the protection God has over us in the time of great trouble, that a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but the plague shall not come nigh thee. Well, the most important thing to know is the first verse. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He will say the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. The promises of protection and deliverance as found in Psalms 91 is only available to the man and woman who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God. In the secret place, you can only go there through praise and worship, through the study of His Word, and by fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Go there now. I'll see you Monday.